and 13 and the recommendation for council action is to grant the application. Okay, we'll move the uh, uh, number three and number four without objection. Uh, go ahead and please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. All right, that is approved. Next item. Next items are items for which public hearings have been held. Items 5 through 30. Uh, items 5 through 11 are confirmation of city officials. Commissioners, do you wish to hold those on the desk? Yes, please. Let's hold the commissioner nominations on the desk. And that would leave before council 12 through 30. And I believe there will be 12 council members today. Do you wish to hold the ordinances on the desk, which would be 12 through 17? Yes, we're waiting, uh, Ms. Hahn uh, and... Mr. Alicone will be here at 11 if, uh, if Ms. Hahn does not make it down by then, so we will um, hold those ordinances until we have uh, 12 members. And then that would leave 18 through 30, and a report has been submitted on item 20. All right. Um, we'll go ahead then and move that report. Um, Mr. Reyes, do you have a special? No. Okay. Any specials, colleagues, 18 through 30? Mr. Alacon, uh, number 26, we'll call it special for him. Um, any other specials? If not, let's take up the balance, please. Please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those are approved. Next items, please. Forthwith on 30 without objection. Next, item. Next items are items for which public hearings have not been held. Items 31 through 42, 10 votes are required for consideration. 31 and 32 are uh, commissioners, and 33 is an ordinance. Do you wish to hold those on the desk? Yes, please. Let's hold those three on the desk. That and do we have cards for the public on the others? Yes. Uh, cards on 34, 35, 37, 38, 39, 40, and 42. Okay. Let's take up uh, 36 and... 41 then. Nobody wishes to call this special. Let's go ahead and prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Okay. Those are approved. Next items, please. Next items are the closed session items, and there are requests to continue two of those matters, uh, items 46 and 47, a request to continue both of those to July 29th. Any objection to continuing 46 and 47, colleagues? If not, let's go ahead and do that. And then do you wish to hold the rest of them, uh, 43, 44, and 45 on the desk? Yes, please. We can go to continuation agenda. Item 48 is an item notice for public hearing. That's a confirmation of building and safety lien. Okay, we have a card on that one, so we'll go ahead and call that uh, special as well. Yes, Mr. Reyes. Council, Pre Council President, um, I apologize if 36 will be reconsidered. Okay, no problem. If we can open the roll on reconsideration of 36, close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11, 12 eyes. And we'll call that special for Mr. Reyes. We do have 12 members now, so uh, with that, let's go ahead and take up the ordinances that we are holding. Uh, that would be uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and also 33. And also for the record on item number 12, that is uh, the... City Clerk has uh, performed the ballot tabulation on that, and that's for the establishment of the Downtown Industrial District uh, BID, and the support is 83 uh, percent, opposition is 17 percent, and there is no majority protest, and that council can proceed with that. Okay. Let's go ahead then on these ordinances, and please uh, take them up, prepare the roll, and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Those are approved. Um, if we can take the commissioners before our public comment, which we'll take after that. Um, I'd like to ask all of our um, planning commissioners, so uh, Ms. Mitchell, Mr. Lehner, Ms. Linick, Mr. Burton, uh, Mr. Acevedo, if you'd all like to come forward to the table, uh, we will go ahead and swing a couple chairs around for them as well. And I'd like to recognize the chair of our Planning Land Use Management Committee, Mr. Reyes, uh, for introductions. And uh, just before that, while they're coming up, Mr. Rosendahl, if you wanted to make a quick presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I'm just using a little personal privilege here for just one second as, as we have these commissioners go forward uh, to talk about giving this wonderful pen to Mike Bonin, who's been with the city almost 12 years. This is his 10-year pen, and I just want us to know that he's been a great asset to to our city, and it's an honor for me to pin on his lapel his 10-year pin. Thank you. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendahl, and, and uh, congratulations uh, very much to, to you, Mr. Bonin. And uh, with that, I will recognize Mr. Reyes uh, to present our commissioners and the committee report. Congratulations, Mr. Bonin. It's only been 12 years. That's pretty good. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask our candidates uh, if they can each one of them identify themselves and share with us which commission you are being appointed or reappointed to and uh, share with us one of two things what you either appreciate the most or learn the most from your previous experience and what you're going to bring to your future appointment or what is it that you'd like to walk away with at the end of this experience so you pick but I would love to have the colleagues understand the level of skill, uh, experience, and expertise we have amongst the candidates here uh, for this uh, very important role in planning and land use for the city. So with that, we can start at the table at the far end and uh, give us your name and the commission that you are being asked to be reappointed to or appointed to. And uh, again, thank you so much for your hard work. So please. Good morning, council members. My name is Faith Mitchell. I am a longtime resident of the Council District 10, and I have been reappointed for a first full term to the Area Planning Commission for South LA. It has been a wonderful experience for the last two and a half years. There are some challenges that we face in our communities with regard to planning and land use decisions, but we remain firmly committed in, in, and uh, organized as a commission to make sure that we make the hard decisions uh, that need to be made with regard to uh, land use planning in our communities. So I thank the mayor for this uh, confidence in me by the reappointment and I look forward to continuing the business of the people. If there was one uh, experience and or uh, case that stands out in your mind in your role would you like to share that with us? Well, I was actually appointed to uh, take care of an issue with regard to a, a, uh, the University Gateway project, which was, as you, the council knows, a, a very long-term process in terms of planning a major um, project in, in and around the surrounding area of the uni University of Southern California. And that was probably the first decision that we made as a commission because there was a, I replaced a commissioner who we only were down to three. And so it was a, a difficult, but as I was encouraged by the remarks of the mayor in our interview, that sometimes you have to make the hard decisions. And that's basically what we do as part of the area planning commission. So it is amazing when you see your name in print by a I would call less than journalists that may not approve of decisions that you made, but needless to say, those are the types of things that you have to do in making those decisions and look at the law and the ordinances that apply to the decisions that we make and know that with confidence that you made the right decision. There are sometimes you go home at night and have those cases where you go home and kick the dog, so to speak, but needless to say, those are the types of things that need to be done and need to make good planning decisions for the community. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Erica Teasley Linick, and I'm reappointed to the West LA Area Planning Commission. Um, I have been uh, having a very uh, exciting time in the, the year, I think, that I've been on the commission. I was um, filling the balance of someone else's uh, spot and found uh, as soon as I got to the commission that there were lots of exciting uh, things on our plate and I was serving with Commissioner Burton at that time. He's now moved on to bigger and better things. <laughs> um, but I think in terms of what I've learned and I sort of mentioned at the POM meeting uh, last week that I think one of the difficult things in West Los Angeles um, that we've been struggling with and, and grappling with have been the issues of uh, you know new projects, bigger projects that have come into communities um, and talking to the community members about character and scale, really working with the community plans versus um, the zoning ordinances and trying to find a balance. I think um, you know when you, you get a, a new building coming in that wants to be rezoned um, and we've been talking about the RAS issues and 
you know, they're coming in um, with a large scale of uh, both living units and retail space, and the folks who've been living in the community with their, you know, single family residences are, um, you know, sort of finding, finding it difficult to uh, sort of welcome these new projects to their neighborhood, and I think one of our jobs, or difficult jobs, has been trying to figure out how to fit these projects in, how to find um, the balance, um, and how to make sure that we're respecting the community and make sure that there is growth and development um, as well. Mr. Reyes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If, if I can ask everybody on this side, if, you, if it isn't a critical conversation you need to be having here, can you please take it behind uh, quarters? There's about six or seven conversations. We'd like to hear the testimony of uh, our commissioners. Sorry, Mr. Reyes, please continue. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, you still got folks talking. The Council President just asked everyone to take your conversations outside. Thank you very much. This is easy, I apologize, but thank you for your hard work. The West Side has a large volume of work, so I appreciate everything you do. Mr. Burton. Uh, good morning. My name is Sean Burton, and I uh, want to thank the mayor for reappointing me to the uh, City Planning Commission and to this uh, body for considering my reappointment. Um, I've served for the last six months on the City Planning Commission. Um, it's been an enjoyable experience, although I will admit uh, more intense than I anticipated. I'm particularly proud of the work uh, that we did on the sign and billboard ordinance. Uh, that was a very, very difficult ordinance, and the, the Gail Goldberg and the city planning staff did a tremendous job in talking to a lot of different constituencies and putting forward a, a very balanced ordinance that I think will significantly reduce billboard blight in the city. And we look forward to, to working with the council as it moves its way through. Well, the extraordinary uh, stages that you've experienced from area planning commission to citywide. Uh, there is a uh, policy of mixed income. Uh, we're trying to address the pressures of housing uh, from a citywide point of view, given the area commission did come from. Can you speak a little bit about those challenges? I think there's a, as a, clearly a continued need for affordable housing uh, within the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and although the economy has made housing somewhat more affordable, it's also disproportionately impacted people in the fact they've lost their jobs, they're being furloughed, they're seeing their wages cut, uh, people are being moved to part-time. So uh, I think a mixed income ordinance is important. What's particularly important, though, I think, though, is that it's you know, debated and discussed at the, at, the, at the city planning commission level, and then we'll make a recommendation to this body about how to move forward forward so that developers and investors, as they're making decisions, can understand what the rules are and design their projects appropriately. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your hard work. Thank you. Sir? Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Lehner. I've been on the Planning Commission for two years. Uh, the most interesting case I think we had was a uh, Home Depot that was trying to go to Sunland, Tahunga. Uh, we had a... We had to move our uh, venue because there were 700 people that came to where we were. Uh, and when we finally made our decision, we had a police escort out of the uh, out of our meeting in at a school in in Sunland. Um, I find it very interesting. I, I'm pretty involved in a lot of things in the city, and this gives me a real good uh, focus on on what's happening at a given time. So, I think it's been quite an interesting experience. Again, thank you. And. Uh was that your first police escort out of a meeting? Yes, it was the first one. Oh, so far, it's the one. last one. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Acevedo. I'm uh, seeking a reappointment to uh, the Central Area Planning Commission, which, as you all know, is, uh, encompasses many of the council districts, including downtown Los Angeles and uh, Hollywood, uh, Westlake, Koreatown, um, amongst other parts of the city. Um, the experience has been a great one thus far and um, very educational for me uh, from a community organizing standpoint, um, understanding um, the business perspective and at the same time making sure that we keep the community's um, input um, um, in mind any time that we uh, take any discretionary actions. I think as a guiding philosophy, um, I've come to the commission with um, uh, the ability to try to ensure that we take every opportunity we can to ensure that we get pedestrian friendly uh, developments into our communities, that we retain the character of many of the uh, uh, communities that, are, that have significant uh, history in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, keeping an eye and a keen eye towards historical preservation I think has been very important at the same time ensuring that we're a business and, and job friendly um, to people that uh, are looking to establish themselves in the city of Los Angeles. So colleagues, as you can hear, we have areas that range from the valley uh, to the west side to central 
to the portions of the east side. So I really believe that the amount of volunteerism and, and citizenry uh, participation that has been exemplified here uh, is something that we need to value and treasure and respect. So I thank you, Council President, for asking the folks here in this horseshoe to pay attention to what they have to say because they are donating their time. And it is a very tough field to work in when you're dealing with people's properties, their development rights, and balancing that with the stakeholders of each community. And that is not an easy task. And that is very hard work. And for that, they deserve the attention to be listened to when they are speaking. So thank you so much, Council President. And again, colleagues, I encourage a unanimous vote, uh, a supportive vote, and hopefully continue working together and dealing with some of the harder issues as we go through these very tough economic times and trying to create uh, a glorious international city that we can become. So thank you very much and I encourage and I vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl, Mr. Zine, and Mr. Parks are the next three speakers. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, first, I, I just want to really thank you, um, um, Erica, uh, for what you've done uh, in West LA. The big issue I had when you were first coming on the board is the same issue I have now, and you already answered it. Uh, every time we do a development project, we have to think of character and scale. We have to think of those who are already in an area. My position is to shove nothing down anybody's throats, uh, but to work with community. Sometimes zoning in a given area was done 20 years ago. Nobody even knows what that zoning is. And that was the Louise project that was an SB 1818 potential that came where people thought it was an R1 neighborhood. It, that was an R3. And it caused great angst. And they put me in the, in the bullseye and attacked me. I had nothing to do with it. But the reality is, is the more we appreciate community, as well as the zoning rights and by right, the better off we are. Obviously, more development is good for the city, uh, for jobs, and for housing, which we desperately need. So I just want to thank you uh, for being quite a leader for us, and, and it's very gratefully received. Thank you. Mr. Burton, uh, you know, you and I are old friends. We go back to, to, to the commission appointed by one governor and gave a report to the other on restructuring the tax system, which they should have listened to us, instead of being the mess they're in today. And you started in the area commission, provide great leadership, and now you're in the citywide commission. Just curious, I saw a strong letter from the city attorney, uh, strongly questioning what you guys just did on some billboard issue. And I, I, I just don't understand what's going on. Can you share with us what that was about, if that's already appropriate for you to talk about that at this time? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. Um, it's a letter that we received uh, on Saturday. It was pursuant to a case we decided last Thursday. Um, the case had to do with a, uh, a contract that the city council had made with the convention center, on a revenue sharing agreement for some billboards on the convention center, and this was the entitlement phase of the process. Um, First of all, I want to say there's, there's clearly no disrespect intended for the city attorney. We have great respect for the city attorney and the city attorney staff, and they're a critical part of the land use decisions and recommendations we make. Um, but there was a request uh, from a continuance from the city attorney's office, uh, but the case was expiring in two days, uh, and there was no specific reason for the city attorney uh, continuance. So we asked the deputy city attorney at the hearing if the city attorney staff had been involved in the case to that date. They said they had. And more importantly, I asked, will the city attorney have an opportunity as this moves through the council process to opine? Because we thought that was important. And they said that they did. And then the deputy city attorney said that this was certainly within our discretion to move, move the case forward. So our goal was to move it forward and let the council debate and discuss how they wanted to move forward. So there was clearly no disrespect intended. I will say I think the last paragraph of that letter was a little bit disturbing um, because it, it implied there may be some sort of personal liability for the commissioners. And it used words like aiding and abetting unlawful action. And, and I will tell you as an individual, you know, we don't have a staff, we don't have a legal defense fund. We do this as commissioners because we're trying to do the right thing for the city. And it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort, but it's worth it because this is our public service. So my, my understanding, though, is probably a misunderstanding. Uh, we look forward to having a productive relationship with the city attorney's office going forward, and we'll work with them at every step of the way to make the best land use decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zion. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to congratulate 
the uh, commissioners for their service. I was going to ask some billboard questions. You've already responded to those. And uh, just one follow-up on the bill, not to belabor the billboards. Was there any influence on the commission regarding passage of that or any lobbying to the commissioners regarding the billboard at the convention center? I, I can't speak to other commissioners. I had no outside discussions with any lobbyists, uh, any political officials or anybody. But okay. I can't speak to other commissioners. Because, you know, it is a very hot potato in the city of Los Angeles, the whole billboard issue. I, I know that very well, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Again, congratulations to you all. Thank you. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just like to uh, thank Faith for coming back uh, and uh, uh, reapplying and getting back involved. But one of the things I think uh, Faith mentioned this one major project dealing with the uh, urban partners and the university issue. But one of the things I think we're also very appreciative, even before she became a commissioner, she was a a person that showed up, I think, at almost every Expo Line meeting and was a very balanced voice as we had community members taking off on a variety of tangents and approaches. She was the level-headed voice in the crowd that talked about the necessity of a uh, rail system, the necessity of public transportation. And so with, I believe, also her time as a CAC member and all the other things certainly in our judgment puts her in a good position to be that on that planning commission so we just want to say thank you on behalf of the eighth district and all the, and we won't hold it against you that you move to the tenth district but uh we do appreciate all the work you're doing looking at the south la area thank you councilman parks we look forward to continuing to make the substantial contribution that at least my household does with regard to um a great community in both council districts as well as to the extent that there is some impact with regard to CD9 as well. Thank you. Mr. Wieser. Thank you and I just want to thank all of you for your time and service to these commissions and I haven't had so many of you all at once that I could ask a very general question that relates to how can we as a city support the work you're doing. Uh, do you have the type of information do you need do you ever sit, to, sit there and say to yourself, well, I wish, I wish the procedures would be this way it's, it, or that way. It could improve how we're serving our con residents. Uh, any feedback you might want to give us at this time so that we can improve this process as we've laid it out? Uh, it's Commissioner Acevedo. Uh, thank you for that opportunity. Um, if I can just make one recommendation. I know with the difficult uh, budget climate that this city and the state finds itself in, I think many times um, the commissioners um, are without the voice of a city attorney uh, in the commissions. And uh, I think that uh, in many cases having their advice assists us in making the right decision that would prevent the potential for litigation against the city, which in the long run may end up costing us more. Oh. Just general thought. Okay, so I, I missed that. So having the advice of the city attorney readily, but does the city attorney attend all your commission meetings? They used to, but they no, no longer, they no longer attend do that. our meetings okay. um, um, with a frequency that I think would uh, give me the surety that the answers that we're giving and the decisions that we're making are okay. uh, in the best interest of the city. Great. That's, that's great to note. I, I was once on the same commission you're on, the East Area Planning Commission, and certainly we used our city attorney advice quite a bit, turning to them often both on procedural issues and also on the substantive land use law. And sometimes it's difficult to make a decision if you don't have that readily available. So thank you for that. We'll, we'll take that into consideration. Anything else? Okay. Great. Well, thank you for your service and your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wesson. I just want to wish everybody luck, but to, to Franklin and Faith, I want to say thanks for everything that you do. Faith is my walking buddy around Rancho Sienica Park, and you know we're redoing it, so it's just about done. So I'll see you back out on the track. All right. With that, let's go ahead and prepare the roll on these nominations and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Congratulations, and thank you all very much for your service. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. If we can take up the next uh, commissioner, number five, uh, please, is uh, the Lacers Board. And that came through uh, our Budget and Finance Committee. And uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Parks as we bring uh, Mr. Or sorry, if we, as we bring Mr. Parks forward. Uh, Ms. Conroy, if you'd like to, s to uh, sit there. Thank you, Mr. President. 
colleagues, uh, we have a appointment for uh, one of our very important commissions dealing with uh, our pension fund. And we had a very extensive uh, budget and finance meeting and spoke about a variety of issues uh, addressing the, the pension fund uh, at this time. And we uh, certainly felt that Ms. Uh, Conroy is more than qualified to be in that position. But I'd like for her, in her own words, to talk about what she thinks about the responsibility. And I think we touched a little bit because of her prior background how she views if there are conflicts of interest and how she will deal with them. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor for appointing me to this commission. Uh, I think I am an excellent uh, fit for this since I was in the investment management business uh, for 23 years for the capital group companies, which is one of the largest investment managers globally. And uh, in that role, they let me do everything but pick stocks, basically. And so I've had a lot of exposure uh, to the institutional plan market, uh, fiduciary issues, corporate governance, products, and uh, I think a lot of the nuts and bolts types of issues that would come before uh, this particular commission. Um, I do realize that there are challenges going forward with respect to funding issues, but that is uh, something that is really a city issue, not a, a, a pension fund issue. Um, I've only been to one meeting, so my uh, knowledge base there is, is just, I'm just at the bottom of the learning curve here, but um, uh, Council Member Parks just asked me about how I would deal with conflicts, and they come up in a number of ways. I think Laces was the one of the city pension boards that was the first to adopt a disclosure rule with respect to pay-to-play. Um, that that was, I think, a really good sign. But it was also a react in reaction, and so I think the challenge here is to be proactive um, and. I'm not certain what types of conflicts would present itself to the board, um, but they're e easier to solve once you always have as your primary focus that you have a fiduciary duty, and our particular duty is to the retirees and current employees of the city of LA. And if you just keep that at the top of your consciousness, uh, it should make life, you know, not not as uh, not as hard in, in trying to identify those issues. Yeah. And I think the uh, Lacers has to be commended because they were well in front of the curve, dealing with some of the corruption issues were identified in, in New York. And I, I would just like to just reemphasize, as we said in committee, that there are three or four uh, audits that are in the audit committee that deal with the pension. There's a requirement of an annual audit. And also recently I created a motion to ask both pension funds to look at the recent study done by the uh, League of Women Voters. And so I hope you make yourself aware of those issues as you proceed in le your learning curve as it relates to this issue. And so I want to thank you for putting yourself forward. And certainly, uh, you may have other questions, but certainly, colleagues, I would ask that we get a unanimous vote because I think we have someone very well qualified, particularly at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Alicorn. Yes, I uh, raised this question uh, yesterday with the nomination for the police and fire pension, um, and that has to do with social responsibility. Uh, the when you when you talk about fiduciary responsibility, uh, I don't, I, I'm not hearing uh, a concern for the corruption and ripoffs that corporate America and the financing industry has been involved with. Uh, that has destroyed our economy. Um, what uh, do you can you offer uh, any suggestions relative to how to manage our funds? Uh, of course, in a way that's fiduciarily responsible, but at the same time, that deals with the issues of of banks that have ripped off people with foreclosures that have not done anything to resolve it. Uh, banks who refuse to get involved in community reinvestment projects. Uh, local investment issues. Uh, are, why should we give uh, our hundreds of millions of dollars to other jurisdictions when we have uh, projects that are worthy here? Um, I didn't hear any sense of uh, concern about social responsibility in any of your comments. I'd like to, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, 
It's definitely something the public fund world that is a very important issue with, uh, uh, unlike corporate America, that is less focused on that with respect to retirement plan issues. Um, from my understanding, the LA City Pension Funds have a very close um, relationship with CalPERS and CalSTRS, which are the 300-pound gorillas with respect to social issues, bringing litigation um, as far as uh, trying to recoup losses in, with toxic assets and all, and that, and, and Lacera, for example, being a $10 billion fund, is well informed of joining those lawsuits when, when appropriate and being part of recouping. So I think that it is part of the, the board's consciousness whether they will be a lead on those bigger issues um, with the, the, that close relationship with, with CalPERS and CalSTRS, I'm not certain. I would need to you know, have a little bit more experience on the board. But as far as my personal view, I think that those types of issues are very, very important, local development. Um, we just adopted, uh, yesterday I saw for the first time that Blazers has adopted an alternative investment policy that says basically invest all things being equal, invest in Los Angeles. Um, those sorts of things are, are very important, legally very legitimate and um, desirable. And so I would personally support um, support that because it does ultimately help well, the... the, the You're holding my time as she was speaking. I'd, um, I just looked down. I have six seconds. It does ultimately uh, help the uh, citizens of Los Angeles with that okay, type of uh, policy. Um, your resume reflects uh, the uh, finance industry as usual. Uh, I don't think we should be looking for leadership on our retirement systems that is usual. I think we need to be cutting edge. We invest a lot of money, uh, $25 billion at any given point in time is invested. Uh, and I, I believe that we need to be much more socially conscious. Uh, I'm not hearing a very strong message from you uh, about uh, an understanding of the direction we need to go in with regard to how we invest our money in financial institutions uh, that uh, I think have acted badly. Um, so I'm, I'm, with all due respect to your experience, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote no uh, to send a message that we have to be much more socially responsible. Okay. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, first of all, welcome and, and thank you uh, for stepping to the plate uh, and providing your leadership. Uh, I have said more than once that our mayor, uh, his legacy in part, will be appointing incredible people to boards and commissions and general managership, and you're one of them. We had some quality time together. In our discussion, uh, you talked about uh, the opportunity, and uh, Mr. Smith and I are talking about actually putting in a motion to discuss this further, about the staffs of the three pension groups that we have. We have DWP, we have Lacers and Police and Fire. They all maintain separate portfolios and separate situations and separate relationships with some of the investments that they do. Without talking about the monies being uh, blended, uh, keeping it separate, keeping accountability and visibility and, and transparency, the notion of maybe integrating some of this right-hand, left-hand business, would you explain a little bit about the notion of how that might be an effective strategy and what do you think about maybe us putting in a motion to explore that idea? Well, I think that um, the the I did review the audit that was issued at the beginning of last year with one of the recommendations that some of the functions of the pension systems of Los Angeles be consolidated in some some way in order to save money. And for example, the easiest way to do this it's not quite specific in the audit, but if you have two, for example, domestic equity, very, very, a commodity, and the systems are not taking their assets together and trying to negotiate fee schedules, which are always asset-based, based on com combined relationships, to my knowledge. Now, that would be something that would not require any, uh, I think, change in, in any staffing or structure of any of the retirement plans. It's just having a business meeting with a money manager saying, hey, we'll give you two, we'll give you two plans if you, if you reduce your fees. Um, there are many, many more opportunities to um, 
I think, streamline functions and share information between all the retirement plan systems. And that would be, I think, my primary interest. And I think my background would be uh, well suited to, to take that on. And given the fact that that was uh, the number one item that the mayor asked me to do. Very good. Well, we, we look forward to working with you uh, on that. Another issue that, of course, is, is one of these huge structural overlooming um, uh, challenges. Uh, and that has to do with the pension system itself and the health care system itself. As you know, we have 30,000 active employees, at least 15,000 retirees. And when a person retires from government, rightly so, they have a nice package. The issue is becoming our budget tends to focus more on government workers and retirement workers and health care. And our services are threatened because the costs have gone so high. Uh, and of course, with the downing economy, the pension issue becomes even more more uh, challenging. The health care, until the president is able to get national health care, has spiraled out of control. Um, and I know that's not your job. Your job is to do the right investments. But having come from the business sector, any reflective thoughts on the challenge facing us right now? Well, that's a very, very long... I think that from what I've heard, the city is moving in the right direction by taking a hard look at all of those assets. I mean, excuse me, all, all different options with re respect to funding retirement plan benefits and compensation in general and payroll numbers because the payroll numbers drive drive the expense, obviously. Um, tiering, this is, I think, a very interesting time because public funds around the country are a little bit behind the, the times in, in, in following the corporate model where you move more to a defined contribution um, model for newer employees. And tiering, I think Orange County is, is looking at that and several other, other uh, uh, public pension funds that will have a combination defined benefit, defined contribution plan, but something that is just the the you know worst case scenario, not to get yourself into the you know the nightmare of GM, because that's basically you think about defined benefit plans, and that's what you you think about, and that's what the city has. So. And I appreciate you uh, tiptoeing on that and working with us because we need to deal with it. You'd also mentioned you were back at the White House the other day. The president invited you back. And you've also been quite active in Lamba Legal Defense as well as the Williams Institute. Will you explain your involvement on that? Well, for several years I've been on the Gay and Lesbian uh, Leadership Council of the Democratic National Committee. So I've been very involved in, in uh, national politics primarily and uh, not local politics, which keeps me out of a lot of trouble as far as getting my name on invitations <laughs> and things like that. So I don't, I don't see that um, that's going to be a problem. And Lambda Leadership, of course, is uh, the um, primary organization for uh, protecting um, gay and lesbian rights and, and marriage equality and the, on a national level. And Williams Institution, of course, of UCLA is the number crunching um, think tank for, for those same issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I do want to say as an openly gay guy that we are role models uh, to young people. Um, as an open lesbian, you, you, you are an inspiration. Uh, and young people watching this know that, that, that we can be just like everybody else in significant positions of power and responsibility and continue to provide leadership uh, for our basic civil and human rights. And I want to thank you for your leadership on the national scene on those issues. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendahl. <clears throat> if we could uh, please take up the roll on this. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So open the roll one more time. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes, one no. That nomination is approved. Thank you very much. Congratulations. We can take up the uh, next commission nominee. For those who are waiting on general public comment, we'll probably be taking that up at 11.15. It is our custom and practice to take up the commissioners uh, before, just before public comment. Um, and I think our next commissioner nomination is number 11. A familiar face in these chambers. We want to welcome back um, our council member emeritus, uh, council member Cindy Mizikowski, I'd like to recognize the chair of our TCT committee, Ms. Hahn, to uh, okay, introduce our committee report.
Ishan? Oh. I was distracted. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we have a great day today where we're uh, actually getting to welcome Cindy Miskowski back uh, to the city family in a new role for her. She's uh, been tapped by our mayor to be to fill the vacancy um, on the Harbor Commission um, that was vacated by uh, David Freeman. And uh, we had her in our uh, Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee this morning, and we had a very good uh, discussion. And, uh, you know, I, I even forgot, Cindy, when I looked at your resume, really, um, what a great um, diverse background you have bringing you to this moment uh, to be a Harbor Commissioner. Uh, but really, your work uh, on the city, you were involved in, in these issues, uh, many of some are still around uh, at the Port of Los Angeles, but you uh, were vice chair of uh, the Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee. I don't think it was called that then. Uh, but you also were the key uh, architect for creating the consensus plan uh, to allow the modernization of LAX to, to move forward. We're still speaking of your uh, green light, yellow light uh, projects. It was, a, it was a brilliant compromise. And that's really what I am most looking forward to uh, that you can bring to the Harbor Commission. We still have uh, issues all the time that will uh, seem to pit um, the creation of jobs, the nurturing of this economic engine uh, with people's ability to have a quality of life as it results to air quality and, and truck traffic. And I really believe your consensus building will prove very valuable as we go forward. Love for you to sort of say what you said to us this morning in committee as it comes to the challenges that you see facing um, the Port of Los Angeles, uh, particularly in this uh, downturn in, in, in our economy, less cargo moving through there, uh, but really, really with the, the new um, emphasis on greening that port, as you talked about. We, don't, we can't grow that port unless it grows green, uh, and we've got in place some of the um, infrastructure to make that happen. So if you could speak a little bit about the challenges, what you see as uh, you know coming our way down at the port. Love to you, for you to touch on uh, the idea of tourism and building the waterfront, and uh, what you think that you can bring uh, as as sort of uh, perspective and experience to this um, great commission. Uh, the commission that I think is one of the best commissions in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you, Councilmember Hahn. Um, first, I'd like to say it's, it's nice to be back and uh, reflecting a little bit on my years here, having been uh, for most of my years here a staff member and then being on the council and now to go on to a commission, I will have had the full array. Um, but it's most interesting to come back and look at the, at the port in particular, having been uh, aware and part of some of the decisions that were going on to make the changes that were critical if the port was going to grow. Um, there, were, there was litigation brought by, for the most part, uh, community groups, but primarily backed by environmental agencies, which were saying that the port did have an effect, um, and, and not necessarily always a positive effect, in the community that it was a part of. And it needed to do a much better job recognizing that. And the community should be receiving some of the benefits of the value of the economic engine that was the Port of Los Angeles. So to go down to the port today and see some of that beginning of uh, the effects uh, from the, the different uh, mitigation funds that were started as part of the litigation, uh, to go back to the community, to do some of the greening uh, and the building of the waterfront, but also just to take parcels that were under the port's ownership that were, were deleterious uh, in terms of just their aesthetic view and to start improving those. All of that towards the goal of not only uh, tourism, but bettering the quality of life for the people who are down there. Um, I think we need to recognize and remember that the port is, is a multi-varied entity. And I think when you talk about tourism, I think a lot of the impact and the concern about the growth of the port has been in the cargo side, the economic driving engine. But we can't ignore some of the others, particularly in the downturn today when the economic engine may be less, um, less potent than it was. One, we need to preserve that and grow that, but to grow the port in diversity. And so that more and more people come down to see the port, um, it's, it really is a jewel 
in Los Angeles, but folks for whatever reason think it's too far to travel or it's too distant and they don't think of coming down there as attractive as, as the Venice beaches or CB11 with our beachfronts uh, for the city. The port is also incredibly not only attractive but exciting. So I think bringing that all together, not only in terms of that operation, but um, making that operation more visible to the vast city is, is going to be a, an interesting and an appropriate challenge. Well, you know, I, I think uh, we've had examples uh, over the past uh, that says if we do something down there, people will come. We have regularly 30,000, 40,000 people that come to the Lobster Festival every year. Uh, the other night, uh, we had Cars and Stripes Forever, which was our kickoff to the July 4th weekend, where we had over 5,000 people that came down to enjoy the new fountain and enjoy uh, uh, dancing to, uh, you know, bands that were playing uh, 60s and 70s music. Uh, so I think think it's a perfect venue to do things, but would love to have uh, your continued um, involvement in that. We know our, our director, uh, Geraldine Natz, has been a big supporter of doing things down on the waterfront. I, I think we need to just provide people an opportunity to come down there, and then they begin to get in the habit of knowing what we do have to offer down there. Uh, but in terms of um, the jobs and the cargo, um, what do you see as... Um, you know, how we need to sort of stay the course on uh, maybe continuing building the infrastructure so that when the economy comes back, we'll be ready. Um, wh what do you see us as our um, kind of path here as we navigate uh, this very difficult uh, economic crisis? Well, it, it's important when we look at the uh, today um, and the recent past, uh, the port has been, number one, the largest port in the country. and But it cannot rest on its laurels because I, I, I would liken it very much to the discussion that's going around in this chamber and around the city about the loss of Hollywood and filming. And it was because we took it for granted. It was just always going to be there. It was going to be the center of the universe. Hollywood was, was that. And we're not trying to play catch up in, in retaining and keeping. And we can't let that happen to our port. We can't rest on our laurels and say we've been number one. So we've got to make it both attractive from, um, from the business perspective. And I think by making it greener, we will make it attractive overall. Um, it will set the pace, but it will set the pace that will um, uh, others will be following us rather than us having to, to run in the other direction. So I think that's got to be our, under, our underpinning to really make sure that economically it continues to thrive and creates the capability of, of growing and not just, as I say, in, in the area of cargo, but in the whole area of diversity of economic engines that run that port. Well, I actually think it's our green uh, cleaner action plan and our green policies that we've had the courage um, to implement out there, whether it's uh, plugging in the ships or encouraging uh, the banning of, of the old dirty diesel trucks, it's actually created a marketplace there for new innovative technology. We now have the first electric truck manufacturer uh, that opened in, in Harbor City. I just read a report where truck sales are 60% up around the, the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, while the rest of the country truck sales are down. So I think we've proven um, that not only can you have clean air and good jobs, but you can have clean air and you're actually creating a marketplace for innovative um, technology, uh, t technology to support the policies that we've had the courage um, to implement when others were afraid to do that. I, I think that's a great example. One of the things that I was reading already in terms of doing some background was that the Clean Air Action Plan, which had a, uh, a rollout period or an expectation of how it would be uh, ramped up has exceeded the expectations on the clean truck purchase far more than what the port had perceived and without taking the port grant. In other words, that the businesses themselves are seeing it's to their economic advantage to do this ahead of the curve. And so, um, I, I like everything, when we have the ability to look back, sometimes taking that courageous first step is really the right step all the way around. Right. And uh, we know that even in tough times, uh, I believe the Port of Los Angeles is our own economic stimulus package here uh, in L.A. It does provide good jobs. It can create even more good jobs in the future through construction projects of terminal expansions, through construction of waterfronts, both in Wilmington and San Pedro, and in this, these uh, 
spinning out of uh, uh, job markets uh, that I think we didn't even uh, intend. We've had some unintended consequences which have been really positive for our economy through our sticking to uh, our Clean Air Action Plan. So we're looking forward to your leadership. I understand there will be election tomorrow and if all goes well we think you might even be the president of the new commission. So I really believe uh, and I don't think you ever really um, probably saw yourself in this position, but life is funny, and sometimes everything we've done in our life leads up to actually almost a perfect scenario of an opportunity uh, that we've been given to fulfill. So I, I really think your background is perfect for this. I look forward to working um, with you and Dr. Natz as we continue to um, focus on our main mission, which of course is goods movement, uh, but also don't uh, let up on the other things that I think will also be so important to our, our economy, uh, particularly through these tough times. So thank you, Cindy, for agreeing to do this. I, I think you're going to be terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hahn. And our next speaker is Mr. Rosendahl, followed by Mr. Reyes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate this opportunity. Welcome back to City Hall. Uh, knowing so intimately the great district that um, you were the leader of, before I had the pleasure uh, to, to follow in your footsteps, there was one big issue that you were engaged in uh, that the people in Playa del Rey um, have been engaged in for years. And you were really working hard on trying to figure out what to do with that thing called the C-shaped parcel, which is part of the um, lagoon there in Playa del Rey. Um, David Friedman had said uh, that, you know, there's something called wetland credits. It was something new for me to understand. And that it was basically going down to Orange County with those wetland credits. And that's when Ms. Hahn and I said, ooh, uh, what kind of monies are there and what opportunities are there for wetlands? And obviously the, the harbor is one area and the Biona wetlands and all the leadership of people engaged with, with Playa del Rey are. And one of the things I'd like you to look at uh, in your new capacity is the opportunity to possibly look at wetland credits f for us in, in the city of L.A. Oh, I, I would very much be interested in being able to connect the dots on that. Um, and clearly the, the responsibility of, of the Port of Los Angeles or any port entity which has uh, denuded wetlands, which obviously occurs when you create a, a major indus industrial activity, um, the responsibility and requirement in the state is to take funds and restore wetlands where they are available. And we have very, very few places in the state which um, qualify, but we do have... Uh, a, a number of parcels that are potential qualifiers in the city of Los Angeles, uh, in our other coastal region on the 11th district, and so I think it makes a perfect match, and I think it's something that uh, I will ask when I get down to the port, uh, what is being done, what other funds might be expected to come forward from projects as they are approved down the line, to see whether or not that, that connection can be made, because particularly that parcel at the end of, of the Delray Lagoon, for those of you who have seen it, it's, it's as wet a land as you can get and yet uh, it is privately owned and still a potential threat for development, uh, even though it looks like a marsh site to me. Um, but I think it would be a perfect uh, restoration project for port restoration lands. I look forward to your leadership on that. And as Ms. Hahn has been pointing out, and the mayor has been pointing out, the port, uh, with the toxicity of diesel um, and its particular matters and, and cancer, is a big deal. And you mentioned in the, in the hearing this morning that there was various court actions over the last eight years and five years that have dramatically changed that. And then I asked you a question about electric vehicles. Could you give us a sense of where we are right now on uh, the port in terms of the toxicity of our air and where you want to take it? Well, I think some of the earliest efforts in the port to, to clean up uh, have, have focused around the effect of diesel. And uh, one of the uh, ways to deal with that is to create electrification at the port. And I said it was Ms. Hahn's leadership under that time where we created an electrification of the port where the ships, uh, the big cargo ships that come in, actually now are required to plug in at the port when they come up for new uh, concession renewal. And that in itself relieves so much of the potency of the of negative air quality. And it was also discussed and, and, and focused uh, during that period of time by some of the litigation that probably the single largest polluter 
in the L.A. Basin region is the Port of Los Angeles. Not intentionally, but by way of the vehicles and the things that have come in. Right. So anything that can be done to change that, and electrification is a part of it, um, getting the rail line, the Alameda Corridor completed, getting more uh, at-point rail lines right into the dock so the crane just literally lifts a, a, a container off of a ship and turns around and puts it on a train. All of that not only is a good economic uh, way of operating, but it's, an, it's a much better way of operating in terms of its air pollution negative impact on the community. And it de 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 uh, deletes all those truck traffic trips, whether pollution or just traffic congestion, that are coming up out of the single um, freeway lines that lead from that southern point. Mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate your answer on that, too. And the, the third question I, I talked about upstairs, too, was the tourism aspect of income's a great uh, cruise ship, uh, and I'd love to see some shuttle operation that would maybe take people uh, to downtown uh, um, um, area there where, where uh, Miss Han is in the port, and also to the Venice Beach where they could possibly go and hang out and walk along the ocean front. And I look forward to your leadership and seeing how we can tie LA Inc tourism and the port to great sites within the city of L.A. Well, I, I think it really uh, should be done uh, because I said the, the port is a great asset, but I don't think it's enough focus from the tourism side, from the city of Los Angeles, not only just for the communities down there and beautifying it aesthetically, but being a, an attraction that people think of when they come to this region, and particularly those who live in this region who aren't as aware of how interesting and fun and exciting a place the port is just to be on the water if it's inviting, if there are things uh, for them to participate in, uh, but just to watch. It's, it's really quite a stunning operation. Well, again, I want to thank you for stepping to the plate, your wealth of knowledge. You are a treasure to the city. Uh, we know we're going to be more enhanced with that proprietary department with your leadership. And again, thank you, Mayor, for putting good people in boards and commissions and general managers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Reyes, followed by Mr. LaBonge. Thank you, Council President. Uh, it's good to see you again, Cindy. It's great to have you back in these chambers. You know, throughout the years, as you've indicated in, in your career, the city has been wrestling with the violence in the city, the, the gang issue, the high dropout rate, and much of it could be dealt with with jobs. And if we can create jobs and create a future for these young people, a lot of these elements that the city goes through can probably be relieved to a great degree, we wouldn't have to use a great majority of our budget for a police state. We can actually use it for creating a better quality of life. So the role of the harbor as one of the economic engines plays a significant one. And we've been asking the executives of the harbor, how are we working with local hiring, local youth? Uh, we have these great uh, visionary scenarios that talk about change, but are we drilling down to the bureaucratic process of identifying young people at our different work source centers? Are we reaching out to the South LA, Southeast, East LA to actually nurture some of these young people to get jobs within our own economic engines? As a commissioner, um, is that a role or is that a uh, policy issue that perhaps you could engage to make sure that there's accountability in that realm of work. And I'd just like to get your opinion on that. Thank you. I, I think it's it's a great opportunity. We've talked about the economic engine down there, and we talked about some of the environmental uh, issues that need to be to change in terms of greening and growing the port. But along with that, and just recently, there has been uh, a major um, discussion and um, negotiation with a major concessionaire renewing a lease and very similar to what was done at the LA uh, airport with the master plan an important element of that was not only the environmental package but something called the community benefits pack package and with this new uh, effort down at the port there are now discussions of in fact it has been included a community benefit package to really talk specifically about that job creation um, job uh, diversity because those jobs there running that port are some of the, the, the highest paying, the best steady kind of jobs. They're not just service industry jobs, 
although even I think in that area on the waterfront development, we can have other opportunities. But clearly there needs to be um, a, a coalescence of, of the opportunities at the port and the stimulus um, for some of these jobs to be developed and continue long term. The port does have a fascinating history of people who work there for generations. You know, whether it's the commercial fishermen who, you know, learned from their parents. But to, to create the diversity and uh, through either the community colleges that are down there and or around the, the, the larger region of opportunities that are there for really good paying quality jobs, I think it's something that the port has, has got to focus on. And I think as a consequence of some of these renewal of leases and new opportunities, that's part of it. The other opportunity is clearly going to be in the development of, of green jobs, green stimulus jobs, whether it's the, the new electric cars, electric trucks, um, all of these things that are going to be new greening opportunities are going to lead necess necessarily to new economic opportunities and new kind of jobs in those new technologies. So all of that has got to be done with a focus and a an involvement on the part of the port of where and how those those whether they're new industries or new jobs how they are they are are they uh, the opportunities for job training along with the job development well there's any kind of language that working with the respective council members council Han and and uh and trying to stimulate and, and figure out a more efficient way of identifying jobs for these young people, I'm sure will be there the second you ask. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lelonge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Misikowski. Just a key, if you make the councilwoman of the 15th district happy, you make all of us happy. Okay. <laughs> she is passionate about the transformation of the port as you are. And I think you're a great experience, Cindy. I've known you as long as I was in City Hall. And you were a great baseball player, too. There's nobody who could pitch like Cindy Misikowski. She's a great athlete. Uh, having those skills, you know how to work with people and make things happen. And I think that's what the port wants to do, make things happen. I know our general manager's here uh, overseeing your appointment, which is great. And the mayor has confidence in you. I have confidence in you that you're going to do the right thing, whether it's tourism, uh, whether it's a green port, uh, what Ed was just talking about so important, even all up the river. Because I know years ago, under Mr. Bradley's administration, there was a little uh, outreach that uh, the port did in San Diego County at some of their lagoons. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And I know there's places within Los Angeles County, I think we could find that, if you would never need to trade those uh, areas off to, whether it's in the old Ferndale section in Griffith Park or some wetlands along the Los Angeles River. But your great experience will help you do a great job in Cindy. Thank you very much. We still look to the left, but Bernard is almost as good as you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bond. I, the only, I remember the last softball game we played. It was Councilmember Hahn and I helping you limp off the field. <laughs> I'm still limping. <laughs> Councilmember Hahn, our final speaker. Ouch. <laughs> I remember that, too. Um, let's see now. Uh, oh, I, I, one of the things... Um, and, and, and I really appreciate you bringing up the idea of jobs because, again, this is an economic engine, uh, but it only is going to work if we can provide uh, good jobs. And I will say that, again, one of the things that's still a little bit in, in limbo is our the part, piece of our clean trucks program that also uh, made the employees of uh, the, uh, the trucks um, get good wages and good benefits because um, the independent truckers for so long have been the backbone of the good move in, in good movement goods movement industry but have not had the wages or benefits that uh, really kept them in those jobs so we hope it all uh, will stay intact so that those can be good paying jobs the other thing is the waterfront um, if the waterfront is completely built out at one uh, point it was projected to have 19,000 construction jobs um, so we know that also could provide good jobs and it could provide if we really built out the waterfront with more retail, more restaurants, more shops, it could provide good summer jobs for kids. Uh, the, the idea of summer jobs has really gone by the wayside, uh, and they're not, uh, we took them for granted growing up, but they don't uh, have those anymore. So that's another possibility. One of the things I was just going to throw at you, don't really have to answer it, but you know, I, when I look at your record, particularly with the LAX modernization plan, it was your creative consensus building 
that actually has allowed that modernization to take place. Um, our waterfront projects in Wilmington, it's a project that's going forward very, very uh, smooth. Uh, that community has uh, built a consensus around the project uh, that's been approved by this council and by the Harbor Commission. On the San Pedro side, um, it's still a little controversial in terms of where everything goes. Um, and when I look at your background, not only just with consensus building, but with planning. I mean, you were really a planner at heart. And um, didn't know if you had any initial thoughts or if you don't have to speak on record, but we certainly do still have some planning controversies surrounding the San Pedro side of the waterfront development. Um, we're looking forward to the EIR coming out, but know that there's still disagreement in terms of where everything goes, from the cruise terminals to what we do at Port Sacal, um, as well as, uh, as some other um, items on that waterfront. Do you have any initial thoughts on how your leadership might maybe, maybe help us come to uh, a consensus on so that we can move forward and build that waterfront as soon as possible? Well, I, I think one has to look at, at where all the views will be. Uh, and then I think it's always important to listen to, to people's negative concerns about why they think something shouldn't happen because a lot of that is based either on fear or misunderstanding or the negativity of what they think might be an impact can be addressed and can be modified in a way that something they thought might have been negative can be turned into something positive. So you, you really listen to everybody and start from what, where that, that playing field is on a level basis and then really see how you can approach the consensus. And, and more often than not, when you really do get people talking around a table to each other instead of at each other and you listen, uh, you can help resolve issues. So um, I look, do look forward. I know the San Pedro Waterfront EIR and, and plan will be coming uh, probably in the first you know, a couple of months of my being there, so it's something that I think will be a time to start rolling up our sleeves and figuring out where the folks are divided, what divides them, and how we can help make that um, make sense from all perspectives. I appreciate that because, again, uh, many of us be believe that a world-class waterfront um, can really um, not just lift San Pedro and, water and Wilmington out of their kind of uh, economic crisis, but we believe it's a regional project. We believe it's a statewide project um, that has great benefits fits the people of California if it is built properly and if it is built with a grand vision uh, of what it can be. We only think we get one shot at building this waterfront and we really would like to see it uh, a world-class waterfront that really rivals any city, uh, not only in this country, but any city internationally. So yeah, I, I think one of the issues, and whether it's this port or, or the way things just were done in the past, um, everything was focused towards the water, but the buildings and structures and things sort of turned their back on the community. And that's where good planning, good access, good openness, good kinds of opportunities doesn't turn the back on, on the very community that it's a part of and welcomes it in and makes it integrated. And I think those, that's the opportunity that the waterfront plan should present, I think can present. Uh, and then the, the, the issue after the, we get the plan resolved is really getting the projects underway and the, and the highest priority ones that really start to make that change and make that identification as soon as possible. That's music. I think that will be music to a lot of people's ears. Um, and again, as we look forward to the economy coming back so that uh, the cargo volumes increase, our longshore uh, men and women uh, can get back to doing the work that they've uh, really been trained to do, uh, but also looking at the diversity jobs out there, whether it's a shipyard uh, or whether it's a waterfront, uh, we've, we've got to diversify our jobs out there so that long term we'll be able to sustain the economy. Um, so thank you and good luck. I think you'll do a great job. Uh, Council, I uh, ask for a unanimous vote on uh, Cindy's appointment to the Harbor Commission. Mr. Uh, President Garcetti. Thank you. Uh, just in conclusion, I think everything's been well covered in terms of the questions, so I'm not standing up to, to ask any questions of you, Ms. Miskowski, but um, in 20 seconds, I just want to say, to me, you represent the very highest of public service. It's great to have you back around this horseshoe. Um, you are somebody who served on the committee that oversees, that oversaw the port, and as such, um, I think are really going to bring a unique perspective, a depth of knowledge, uh, a political sensibility as well, and so I'm just overjoyed to see you back officially in some city service, and you have my very full support. Very well. With that, we shall open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Thirteen eyes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Congratulations, Cindy. All right.
right, our next item, please. Next item is item 31, and uh, that is confirmation of Dr. Julie Mendoza to the Board of Library Commissioners. All right. Please come forward, Mr. LaVange. Uh, members, Dr. Mendoza is an excellent member of the Board of Library Commissioners, a uh, Harbor City resident, uh, very dedicated in her efforts here to improve education, working closely on the collaboratives throughout the city on improving education. Strongly recommend an I vote. With those comments, you don't have to say anything. Thank you. Uh, no one uh, has anything else on you that matter? Go ahead. I, I, Move it. Let's, let's just that, ask, and I'll just say, say if you wish to say something, but you've got the votes right now. Thank you. I just would like to thank the mayor for the opportunities to serve um, uh, the city and also all of you for um, your consideration. I think that the city public library is an amazing resource and in many ways it's uh, one of the healthiest infrastructures and department and I just look forward to working with all of you to build and to make it um, much better than what it currently is. Thank you. We thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza. With that, we, I vote. With that, we will open the Roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Thirteen eyes. There was a card on that. It had a hearing committee. Thank you. Thank you. You got that. What? This was waived in committee. All right, uh, Doc. You have to come back. We thought this was heard in committee. There are some cards from the public, so we will uh, hear from those individuals. Doctor. Well, let's open for reconsideration. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 eyes. All right. Doctor, please uh, take the seat again. We thought that the uh, hearing took place. It was waived in committee, so we have three doctor, cards doctor, from the public. Sit there. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. And the matter is now before us for public comment. Sorry. Uh, Zuma Dog in the San Fernando Valley. Is Zuma Dog in the San Fernando Valley? For Since comments? there are other cards, I'll pass to save time. All right, thank you, Zuma Dog. John Walsh, followed by Arnold Sachs. Those are our three cards on this matter. You have to fight to be heard. Uh, first of all, heartily uh, accept the nomination of uh, Miss Mendoza. We have a problem, especially in the Hollywood Library, of people living in the library. We have uh, racism in the library. We have a group of white Klansmen or whatever they are harassing minorities at the Hollywood Library. Uh, let me explain that. That's racism. White against minority. Uh, the library is doing the best they can. I hope you'll see some, uh, deal with this. If you want to know more about this, hollywoodhighlands.org. And also, I want you to know that the elevators at the Hollywood Library are over a year old, their inspections. The inspections at the library, the, the, the certificate ran out in June. Now this is true all over the city. You don't, you're not inspecting your elevators. I want people to know when they get on those elevators, check that date. And if it's more than a year, you're taking a chance. Thank you. Arnold Sachs, our final speaker. Thank you. Good morning. Arnold Sachs. Congratulations, doctor. But let me inform you of your patient. Part of your patient's amnesia is the city council. You might have heard him discuss or touch on the convention center and the um, advertising that was just approved by the planning commission. But it was this city council in its actions that allowed the convention center to put that Mr. President, he is not speaking about the confirmation of the Excuse me. library. Uh, would you please, who's running this meeting? Could you clear? You, you have a comment to make, sir. If you do, please make your comment. He's being the center, the advertising at the convention center. Is that nothing to do with the convention center? This is about the library commissioner. Yes, it is. And Councilman LaBonge asked for some of the funding from the convention center advertising go to the library. This is about if the you commissioner. pay attention to what happens in the chamber, I'll tie that in. Now the commissioner is heading on the city, the library commission. And she's going to be maybe looking out for those funds that come from the advertising from the convention center that Councilman LaBonge asked to go towards the library when it was considered in council chambers. 
Does that make sense now, sir? Thank you. Would you put my time back because this explanation to you and the city attorney. Your time is running, sir, so continue. Yes, I understand. Anyway, the council made the vote. The problem is, doctor, that the council voted for the advertisement with the contract with LA Arena Land Company, but the advertising belongs to AEG. So there's the problem that you face. Absence of attention by the council members to know what goes on in the council, and the problem of the duplicity in their voting. Good luck with your position. That the commissioner is now before us, Dr. Mendoza. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 eyes. Congratulations, doctor. Next item, please. Next item is item 32, confirmation of Ms. Andrea Orden to the Board of Police Commissioners, and I believe there are cards on this item as well. Number 32. Mr. Koretz, recognize Mr. Koretz. Mr. Koretz, our Chair of Public Safety. Uh, I would, uh, my Mr. Mr. LaVange? Right. My colleague for the day asked me, this is a great commissioner. This is a commissioner who cares about the city, cares about the police department, cares about making the police department better and has. Uh, an excellent appointee, and I call for her reappointment uh, on behalf of uh, the uh, people that I represent. Thank you, the city of Los Angeles. Commissioner Orton, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. We have uh, some public comment, and then we will go to the, uh, the council members on this matter. Um, we have Zuma Dog in the San Fernando Valley. To save time, since we're late today, I'll pass on this. Thank you, Mr. Zuma Dog. John Walsh and Arnold Sachs. And then we'll go to our council colleagues. Uh, we call for the reappointment. We're very interested in the lawlessness that the police commissioner can solve in Hollywood. Two weeks ago at the Get Love Free Food, which is next to the Country Church of Hollywood, which was burned down by skinhead Nazis three years ago, uh, it, just two weeks ago, Someone in the line was stabbed to death. His name was Craig. No stories in the Times. We can't get any information. There's a bouquet of flowers out there. This organization that is giving out free food has no security. The person was stabbed four or five times and bled to death. That's what's happening in Hollywood. And as you know, although the Nazi skinheads burned down the little country church of Hollywood, the city council here has refused to have a award, have a reward. But then again, being a civil libertarian, I support your position of being Nazi tolerant when it's a church. Uh, I would also like to point out what an excellent job the police did at the, uh, at the mayor's uh, inauguration because the building service pushed us on the, on the other side of the street and said we had no constitutional right to be on the same side of the street as the inauguration. Uh, one of our group went, talked to the, all the way up to the assistant, uh, the assistant chief. The assistant chief agreed with us, countermanded the building service police under constitutional rights. If the public is allowed there, anyone with a sign is allowed there. So, you know, the city of Los Angeles is in a very strange position when the top ACLU people and the top police sound like the same. Only Mr. Antonio Villaragosa is anti-ACLU, and he used to be president of ACLU. HollywoodHighlands.org for the rest of the information on what's happening. Thank you. Arnold Sachs. Arnold Sachs is waving his time. We will go to uh, Mr. Wiesar. Thank you very, very much, Mr. President. And Mr. LeBond, you're correct. This is a great commissioner, and I thank you for your work. I do have a question on the May Day episode and some of the outcomes from what happened at the park after that march. Uh, there was a special uh, committee that was set up by this council. We reviewed uh, some of the actions, and uh, then the police commission took some actions as well, as did the, um, 
our Chief of Police. Uh, what are your thoughts on the outcome? Did the city handle it correctly? Did our police department pay as, uh, uh, proper attention? And do we have proper procedures in place so that we do not witness another episode like that again? I'll take the last uh, question first if I can. I mm -hmm. do believe that we have the procedures in place. We have a commitment to continuing training. We have had several opportunities uh, to have policing events where there are very, very large numbers of persons and the possibilities of public disturbances, which have gone extremely well. Uh, the, the, not only was the report done by the chief quite extraordinary in terms of its transparency, in terms of its very specific recommendations and its very uh, detailed information, there was a timeline for various changes and that timeline comes before the commission on a regular basis to see where we are and how much we have accomplished. Uh, we have our most recent report uh, indicated uh, basically that everything had been checked off. Now, just because everything's checked off, that doesn't mean it's over because obviously it's, I said to someone else, it's sort of like painting the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you start and it's really looking great and it's wonderful and you finish it and you really feel, boy, I did that. And then you've just got to start all over again. Yeah. And, and that's the same thing here. But I, I, the lessons were learned. I think lessons are still being learned uh, in terms of, of the what occurred there. And then the next issue is, uh, uh, you know, the the personal responsibility and the accountability for individuals who were involved. That has, we've had the report that's gone through the system. We have Board of Rights. There, that is a different system, uh, uh, and it, that's the one that uh, requires uh, the, the discipline. And, yeah. and there is a record of how many were disciplined and for how much. Yeah. And have you had a chance to review those reports? I, uh, we have. We yeah, have. And in your opinion, do you think uh, for those who took actions that day outside of proper procedure, um, do you think we got the... I think we handled the procedures appropriately, and I think well done in terms of that. One of my questions at one of the meetings was, who really puts on the Board of Rights hearings? You know, is there an equal presentation on both sides? But I think the procedures were done well. Uh, obviously, reasonable people can always differ on how the ultimate results uh, came out mm -hmm. on individuals. And, and you've got to recognize that, that those are hearings where people testify. Yeah, and different. unless you're there, unless you really know that, yeah. it's hard to know uh, whether it was a right decision or a wrong decision. Yeah, it's a quasi-judicial um, procedure, and anything Absolutely. can happen in different processes and hearing requirements. But, well, thank you, and thank you for your work on this, because I know that um, as we move forward to have our officers conduct themselves and, and treat our residents in a proper manner, what we saw throughout the country and the world is not representative, in my opinion, of our officers in LAPD, and, and hopefully this is something that, that uh, has been put behind us. Uh, again, we will probably see others. We thought that Ronnie King was the last of it. We thought that the Rampart scandal was the last of it, and here we have May Day. Um, but hopefully uh, these new procedures that are put in place and the work of your commission, uh, we've come a long way with that. So I have noticed um, uh, marches since then or large gatherings since then that the officers in briefing me on what their processes and procedures, there is a lot more uh, sensitivity to working with the people, the marchers, rather than in a confrontational manner, which could escalate. So uh, thank you for your, for your work and your service, and we look forward to continue to improve our service to the residents through the LAPD. I thank you very much, and, and if any of you were, and I know many of you were, walking the uh, streets in Central uh, uh, on and around the time of the uh, Jackson Memorial, there, there are legitimate questions about cost and, and staffing and, and those things. There wasn't a criticism anywhere about the manner or demeanor of our men and women who were uh, there policing and at all of the venues. So th this was a very good thing. Mr. Rosendahl, followed by Ms. Hahn and Mr. Alicorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate that. Uh, 
Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you here. And as Mr. Lebon said, you are great, and we're looking forward to reconfirming you. But here are a couple of hard questions. I first get elected to this job, and I find out we got a couple of dozen cops at LAX, LAPD, where LAWA and all the other groups say we don't need these cops, uh, that we can manage this place without those cops. So uh, you're down to 16, I'm told, of officers still there. We're paying for that out of the general fund, you know, at not Lawa. I don't understand if, if the airport feels they're secure enough and, you know, they, they, they're trained at uh, the, air, the academy, um, they've got their act together, they're recruiting more people and everything else. Why do we still have 16 LAPD officers at the airport paid for by the general fund and not paid by LAWA? Help me on that. I, I can help you with a little bit of the history, and, and it wasn't anything that was specifically on my, my watch sure. in terms of the five commissioners. We try and divide up uh, responsibilities for various issues. was not one of mine. But I do know as we started into the coordination with the L.A. Police Department uh, and the airport, uh, lots of top-level meetings were occurred, command staff on both sides, to best coordinate, to, to make that trans, uh, transfer of authority uh, safe, secure, and collegial. Uh, I go to the, uh, uh, the graduations and, and every, uh, uh, every other month or so, and we graduate the recruits for the airport police at the same time, as you now know. Right. So I, I think we've done an enormous amount to make that the kind of coordination it ought to be and have that police force have the independence it needs. Now, it sounds to me as if everyone on the LAPD side believes that that additional 12 is still appropriate uh, at this time. But I will go back and I will talk to the department and we'll get you a much more specific answer. Yeah, I'd like an answer because I'm told it's 16, or you just said 12, I don't know how many it is. But whatever it is, it's coming from the general fund. And LAWA, you know, has the money to take care of things if they believe they need those officers. I'd like to get that resolved. We're in a tough budget crisis. Last thing we need to do is take general taxpayers' money when there's the airport money for this. And, and, and if there is no, uh, no necessity for it. Exactly. So that's what we have to find out. I look forward to that. Second thing is, you're a lady, you're a woman, uh, and I really want more women in the police department. I am thrilled with the diversity that has taken place for Latinos, African Americans. I even like the, the way the gay recruiting has happened and how the police have worked with the various demonstrations on the No on 8 and all that. It's been really great. But not enough women, in my opinion. What's the percentage of women officers and what work are we doing to recruit more women to, to the ranks? Our overall numbers for women are uh, approximately 19% which is too low. Uh, we have women, however, in uh, leadership uh, roles throughout the department yeah. at a rate that we have never had before, including uh, uh, a, a, deputy, a deputy chief and an assistant chief at the very, very top of this organization. Uh, we have, under the leadership of Chief Bratton, we started a women's uh, forum, uh, and it has now grown to one of the most popular events of the whole year. We have 1,100 women, civilian and sworn, uh, who come to an all-day training program with some of the best role models in the world, uh, who some of whom are individual chiefs of departments. We have recruiting um, at our Manchester facility uh, for for women, um, and again, bring our best officers who, who just generate the excitement of the career uh, for them and hopefully communicate it. Uh, we are doing many different things. We need to do more. We have a special program for upper, upper body strength uh, training. One of the areas that women pass the physical very, very easily for running the five miles yeah. and doing these other things. Right. But it's the upper body strength still that, that traditionally we just don't train as much in high school and in our colleges. So we have a special program for that as well where they have mentors and mentees that take them through that. So all of those things we're doing, including 
hoping, if nothing else, we've got some flex time, and so we're certainly hoping that for those women who have families, too, that they'll see this as the terrific job it is. And, and I, I appreciate your leadership on that. You've done a great job. Last thing is, people always say to me, constituents, why do we have able-bodied officers sitting at the desks where civilians can be there? After whittling it into the process of the budget, the figure that basically I've heard most recently is 70. Uh, uh, able-bodied officers sitting in a civilian job. A civilian job is 70 cents on the dollar. And when are we going to get rid of healthy sworn officers from sitting at a civilian job when a civilian can do it cheaper and frankly doesn't need a, a, an officer to do that? Well, you're, you're asking that question. It's probably one of the worst times uh, to get any kind of concrete answer. I mean, we are desperately uh, working with the budget which this uh, council has been kind enough to give to us which is which is of course you know that shows real respect for the men and women of this department civilian and sworn but it's it's all a question of resources and and as much as possible we want civilians and civilian jobs and we want sworn officers in sworn jobs and that's at the very top of a lot of our managers to keep trying to do that but we have vacancies as you know at the civilian side that is unsustainable at the moment. Well, thank you so much for your leadership on the commission. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Hahn, followed by Mr. Alacon, Mr. Koretz. Thank you very much. And again, uh, thank you for agreeing to serve another term on this very important commission. Um, and again, it's such an interesting form of government that we have here in Los Angeles where we actually empower citizens um, to basically run the department. I mean, you're responsible for uh, giving instructions to the chief. Uh, you're you're uh, responsible for really, um, you know, how things are going and, and uh, uh, how the chief is performing. Uh, you brought it up earlier, the, the Michael Jackson. Uh, service and I, I think uh, maybe be, be a good opportunity uh, for you I know we don't have all the initial uh, reports and, and accounts in but I, I think um, just from your perspective as one of the, the citizens who you know has been given uh, the authority on this commission do you believe uh, that the chief acted uh, prudently and appropriately in terms of uh, the number of of officers that he felt uh, were needed uh, for that day. Uh, and then, uh, and again, and I will say I was very proud uh, of Chief Bratton, frankly. I was very proud of our police department because there's been a lot of criticism about a lot of things, but it's never been about uh, the men and women who were on duty that day. And I think Los Angeles looked very good to the world that was watching, and that we had a very safe and orderly uh, service, which I think uh, was respectful and uh, had a lot of dignity attached to it. And I think our police presence was one of the reasons that I think it, it came off that way. But do you think the chief acted appropriately? The other thing that uh, you were criticized for, the, the police department, uh, that day was um, the uh, sandwiches uh, that were purchased from a vendor in Wrightwood uh, that uh, amounted to about $14 per person that day. And there was the question, certainly troubling, um, maybe the cost seemed a little bit high, but I think for a lot of us, uh, one of the issues was, gee, if you're going to do that, uh, we could have at least benefited from having that contract go to a local vendor uh, who could also have provided uh, the same um, uh, food and we would have benefited, our vendors would have benefited, and we would have gotten some of that sales tax revenue. So just on those two issues, how do you think the chief performed? Uh, was that appropriate? And uh, do you think uh, the, the sandwich issue was handled appropriately? Hold my time. All 16 seconds. Uh, on the first question, yes, the chief uh, uh, performed uh, uh, absolutely appropriately. Uh, and it wasn't, of course, just the chief. And it wasn't uh, just uh, uh, a, few, a few people. Uh, this was the command staff. Uh, this was Earl Passenger, as you well know, and, and many, many others, uh, Albanese, uh, uh, all of the central folks. Uh, 
they took the best information they had about how many people would come downtown. And it was obviously, as we heard, a much higher figure, uh, uh, a much higher figure had been anticipated. But of course, part of the reason it was down as much as it was is that at every 20 or 40 seconds, somebody was saying, please don't come downtown. You won't be able to see anything. It is going to be on television. Please stay home. Uh, many of us were here uh, at the Olympics, uh, and if you recall, we were so worried about the traffic, and we were so worried uh, that we wouldn't be able to move and uh, breathe, and in fact, people did stay home, and people did leave, and, and uh, we were able to absolutely accommodate the visitors. Well, it's somewhat similar here. They made their best judgment. All of us in this room would love it if we had guessed, you know, a, 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 a some thousand smaller. But I believe the planning system worked, uh, as you said, uh, and even the LA Times. I mean, when is the last time that you can search the word flawlessly and terrific and within five words of the LAPD and you come up with an LA Times editorial? So obviously it was executed perfectly. Um, and I think appropriately it, the judgment was made to prepare and as it turned out over prepared in terms of the actual numbers. But again, it was set up so that as soon as the right people passed on it, folks were sent home. So, you know, uh, first a thousand and then five, uh, maybe another 500 after that. So, um, th th my answer, long answer was yes. Uh, your second question. Sandwich gate. Sandwich gate. Uh, my understanding, and it's all afterwards, is we don't actually do the sandwich ordering. I believe, it, I don't know if there is someone here who knows for sure. DOC. Yeah, the DOC does. D yes. DOC. DOC. So I understand that's being looked into, and it, it actually wasn't on um, our watch. So, uh, But I think everyone is looking to see why it was and the speed, who can do it. And I understand we now have a controller who's looking at it very specifically. Right. Thank you for that. Um, do you, uh, now, uh, also part of the chief's duty is to regularly present to you uh, sort of the budget of the department, um, uh, accounting for expenditures. Uh, uh, was, uh, when, when the chief presents this to the commission, um, does he talk about extraordinary events that may take place in the city, and is that budgeted for um, in the normal uh, police budget that is presented to you annually? You know, I don't remember ever looking at a page that said that. Of course, we get the whole budget and uh, we have it, you know, both on disk and in hard copy. And I don't remember a page that looks like that, but I do know that those extraordinary circumstances are part of living in Los Angeles and they are a part of an expected part, not just emergencies of fires or, or accidents or, or, or earthquakes, but demonstrations and, and memorials and, and celebrations. So it's definitely a, a built-in part uh, whether it has any special line item, right. I don't recall it that way. But right. we and, and, and maybe the council is going to ask for th for that accounting from from the chief. But maybe that be something the commission would also happy to maybe do agendize that. happy to uh, do at, that at one of your meetings and have the, have the chief report to that. And I know my time's almost up, but I, I do want to say I have really appreciated um, the leadership of this particular commission as it re relates to uh, this police department having a completely um, evolved relationship with their. Community community members, particularly um, uh, in the Watts community with the Watts Gang Task Force. I think ch the Chief's phrase, we can't arrest our way out of the gang problem, has really um, gone throughout the, the rank and file police officers and they know there's more to solving crime and to solving the gang violence problem than just um, suppression. And I have been very impressed uh, with the level of cooperation between police officers for the first time in the history of LA and intervention workers and prevention workers and they are our partners particularly in the Watts community as it relates to trying to find the root problems of gang violence and working um, hand in hand to really prevent 
kids from joining gangs in the first place. It's been really um, inspiring for me to watch the rank and file, but not just the rank and file, all the way up to the command staff, uh, which obviously starts with the leadership of the chief and the commission. Thank you for this new direction um, that I think our department is taking uh, in terms of a real holistic look at, at crime in Los Angeles. Well, I thank you very much for saying that, and I, that, that is precisely what I see when I, when I go out and uh, in the community, one of the most touching uh, uh, events uh, just recently was uh, our president, Anthony Pacheco, after a full four years, did have to step down and go back to his day job. <laughs> and uh, we had a small coffee. And, and one of the uh, presentations uh, was from the Korean community, because uh, he had been seen to, so active there, the building of the new uh, station house, coming out to roll calls, doing those things. And, and it, I mean, it brought tears to some of the command staff eyes, the, how, how appreciative uh, they were. So uh, I'm glad you have felt that and seen that. That's what I see and feel. I know there will only be more effort on that in the future. And I thank everybody for the support that we have received uh, as a department and as a commission, whether it's on the cameras in the cars or uh, the, inspector, the role of the inspector general and his staffing. Um, and so I, I thank you, and I know we'll be back for more. Thank, thank you, you. Ms. Thank Hunt. you for your service. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Alicorn, followed by final speaker, Mr. Koretz. I was wondering what you think about social responsibility. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I am for it. <laughs> Honesty. Um, we, uh, we, our movie industry is losing production opportunities and you know obviously to some degree related to the economic situation we're in but uh, constantly over the last 20 years we've been losing the movie industry uh, they have made it loud and uh, very loud and clear statement that they do not want to use uh, LAPD officers as security on their on their sites um, and yet we, we seem to have put ourselves into uh, a fighting match that uh, wasn't really a problem to begin with. Uh, where, where's the commission going to go with this problem? Well, I'd like to uh, put this aside uh, and target expanding opportunities for production as opposed to re re uh, creating challenges for production. So where are we going to go on this? Well, I, I can only speak as one commissioner at the moment, and of course we've heard uh, the, those, those arguments. And, and of course, as a citizen of Los Angeles and, and someone who hoped to be in that industry growing up, uh, but had to go to law school instead, uh, I, I certainly would like to see a vibrant and successful uh, motion picture television industry here and not in uh, Connecticut and not in Canada and not outside of our Los Angeles. So uh, there's just no question that that's an important goal. Uh, the, the reason, as, as you well know, and as has been articulated by our chief, uh, for the change in the procedure is that at the moment we have wonderful, talented, retired officers who are dressed as if they were still Los Angeles police officers. And they are not. I mean, you, they are, they are perhaps even violating a, muni a municipal code that says you may not impersonate an officer. So the answer is that we have to change that uniform. It can be the same people, it, those same talented, People with the great expertise that they had as officers can still be there, but they can't be Los Angeles police officers because they're not. Uh, so I, I think the chief has got it right in terms of taking it in two steps. Let's first get the, the uniform right, and then we'll work out whatever it is about costs or whatever else it is. The issue is not cost. The issue is our economy. If it wasn't broke, why fix it? Uh, it's been that way forever. There's never been a problem. I mean, there's been some minor problems, but 
problems are going to occur whether they're in this uniform or that. But if you take away that uniform, uh, you've taken away the security feature. And, and I don't believe it's gonna, that, that the people on the street will give them the same respect that, that uh, LAPD officers get. We do not need to be spending LAPD officer time uh, on, on that, even extra time, because we need them to be available for other emergencies. And, and, and yet, if they were available for other emergencies and pulled off the site, then we have a problem at the, at the movie location. Uh, so I don't think that is forward thinking, and I'm very disappointed to hear that. Thank you. Mr. Kretz, our final speaker. Well, first I say uh, ditto to Mr. Alarcon on his uh, concerns uh, uh, about, about the film industry and, and the retired cops and how we're looking at uh, changing an approach that has worked for decades without any problems that anyone has seen surface uh, uh, for a very successful process. Um, but the, the reason I want to address you, in addition to just saying thank you for your willingness to take on a difficult job and to continue in this capacity, um, is to state even more strongly than, than Mr. Rosendahl my concerns uh, about the airport police. Because I come in with uh, a very uh, healthy desire to eliminate waste and duplication in the city. And the most visible symbol to me of, of waste of city dollars is the LAPD folks that are at the airport. Um, the airport police are paid for by the airport. LAPD are paid for by us. Um, I think they're there really because the LAPD wanted to take over that function. It's not going to happen. So it's, it's almost, they're there as a protest, but they're there as a protest by the department that costs us a million dollars or so every year for absolutely no reason. And at least on behalf of one council member, and I believe many of us, uh, I'd like to say no. We really need to communicate this to, um, to the LAPD, pull these folks out. If we really think we need more officers, which I don't think anybody thinks, tell the airport police we, we need to have some more folks hired over there, talk to the airport people in charge of the airports, the airport commissioners. Um, but right now this is just a waste of money. So the question is, what will you do about that proactively rather than just come back to us and tell us why? Um, I want to know what you'll do to try to actively, actively, proactively change this situation and get those folks out of there as soon as possible and get them back out patrolling our streets where they're needed. Well, at the moment, I don't have a view that that is something that is, is necessary to do proactively. It may very well be, but the first thing I will do is uh, the other suggestion, which is to get fully briefed on it and come back to you with our, our present reason for it and what our, our plan is for the future. Well, I, if, if I can continue, I, I wish I could, I could get a commitment to be more aggressive on that issue from you, because I think this is a real problem where we can identify real obvious duplication in the city budget um, and an easy way to, to fix it in this particular situation that we're in this year, we, we have to take advantage of those opportunities. We have to take advantage of all such opportunities. I certainly agree on that. And we'll return uh, as I walk back over there to uh, get briefed on exactly what the present situation is and to be able to report back. And, and hopefully communicate uh, the, the strong feelings of at least one and I believe many more than one council member to, to see this change. Absolutely. Thank you. Very well. Mr. Smith, our last final speaker. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I do uh, join my colleagues saying I appreciate your service. My concern is that we've had a lot of problems um, maybe communicating with our chief, but it seems like the commission just rubber stamps what their chief tells them to do. And I'm very concerned about that. The discussion we had, Mr. Alicorn brought up about the uniforms. The City Council Committee on Public Safety and the Budget and Finance Committee, or committee held a joint hearing on this matter. And said very clearly, unanimously, the committees both unanimously said, we don't want to go down that road. 
that you're doing something to harm our biggest industry, and we don't see that there's been a problem. There's never been a single complaint against those officers. There's never been a concern about use of the uniform from any previous chief going back 30, 40 years. It's a system that's worked, and there's some flaws in it that need to be fixed. Ms. Ms. Perry's had some concerns about those officers and how they, they regulate the conditions of the permits. That's the only concern anyone's ever had. And yet your chief comes to you, makes a recommendation, and you guys don't even vote on it, so we can never 245 it and bring it back to the council and just go along with what he said. Secondly, the issue of the airport police. It's been in budget finance for three years. And for three years, the budget finance committee said, get out of the airport. They have built their department up. They've doubled the size. They've trained with LAPD. They've done everything that the chief asked them to do. And we don't need them there. We don't want them there, the airport says. And the council committee, who pays the bills, said we don't want to pay that bill anymore, and yet they're still there. And finally, I've heard recently that the council budget and finance committee, when they approved, and this council approved, the purchases of tasers, which we didn't have enough money to buy for the whole department, the chief had a plan that he wanted to give them to certain officers. That this committee and, and, and uh, the council said, we are going to purchase those tasers, but we want them put in the kit room so that officers going in the fields have first pick on them. And I hear from people running kit rooms in our departments that they don't have those tasers that the chief gave them out to the people he wanted to give them out, which was his original plan in direct defiance of this city council. And so I'm very concerned that the oversight of the commission has been very lax that the attitude of the chief is he doesn't care what the city council and mayor say. He's going to run the department the way he wants to run it. And I'm very concerned that the leadership of the LAPD is not listening to the policy-making body of this city, which sits in this chamber and in the mayor's office. And I'd like your comments on that. As you well know, there are five commissioners. Uh, I think that uh, each of us takes very seriously the responsibility of oversight. We are volunteers, so some of us spend only 15 or 20 hours a week. Others spend 30, 35 hours a week. And many of the details are operational rather than policy, rather than major policy. Um, we are fortunate to have an extraordinary inspector general with a great staff, a great commission staff. And with the assistance of all of that, I think we are an independent and uh, activist is, if the word is allowed to be used, uh, a commission. I'm not sure the chief would feel precisely the same way that you do, that uh, he all he has to do is suggest and, and we approve. Uh, as to individual items like that, maybe there ought to be a better way that the city council persons or the public could communicate more directly with us. We're there every Tuesday every Tuesday, uh, 9.30 uh, meeting. Uh, we have special community meetings as well. Sometimes an issue may not get to us through the, the various bureaucracy. And so if there are individual issues, either through a letter or through an appearance uh, agendized on our meeting, we would love to hear about those other issues. Uh, we, would, we want to take into account all the various views. But I must admit, on the, on the two that we, you know, the one that we talked about, about the, uh, the uh, uniforms, um, that seems to me to g genuinely be the right answer. On the airport, I want to know more facts. I want to know where we are now. I know how tough that relationship was in the beginning, as you well know. And if, if my getting together with the people in the airport and the LAPD all in the same room or on the same uh, podium is any example, the relationship is excellent right now. So if we can save some money, I'm sure everybody would want to do that. Okay. Well, I thank you for your viewpoint. Um, and maybe it's our mistake in, in trusting that when we have meetings and the chief of police and or his command staff sits there and listens to us that the message gets back and evidently it doesn't get back. So we're going to start, uh, uh, I presume, uh, when the committee appointments come out, I'll still be on public safety and budget, I presume. Uh, and I will start instructing our CLA to send a letter directly to the commission 
on these points of view so that you know directly rather than counting on our chief to deliver that message because he is not delivering it to you. But I'm not saying he's not delivering it. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that... Uh, well, that well, were you aware when you talked about the uniforms of city council committees to them that said unanimously, we don't want you to do this? Oh, I, I was aware that the city council did not. Yes, I did was, and I told you that I, I happened to agree with the position of the department. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, on the airport, on the airport issue and the 12 or how many other people there are, I am not familiar with that. That is our final speaker on this matter. The matter is now before us. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 eyes, 1 no. There you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have a request from Mr. Reyes for number 36. <laughs> Madam Clerk, number 36, please. Uh, yes, that was called special by Council Member Reyes. <laughs> Mr. Reyes, we have one card. We'd like to hear from the, okay. Barbara Berkey on number 36. Are you here? Yeah. There she is. Number 36, ma'am. You also have one for a general comment, but this is number 36. Um, and it's the one I didn't quite finish up. Okay. I just wanted to tell you I'm working, um, Barbara Monty and Burke from the Studio City Neighborhood Council, uh, and I work uh, for our council with the river. And to do with this, the Army Corps of Engineers and all, I, I do think, number four, that there should be public input um, is very, very important important to do with the potential federal river projects. We are trying our darndest to um, keep up with what is happening not only within the city but also the council, uh, also the county and the state and the federal government. And we really are interested in funding the projects. We were not given one of the five major notes, and so we are all for having this. And if there is a task force, um, called for this, we would like to participate in it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reyes, number 36. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, to address the concerns of the speaker, we are having a workshop on July 28th to talk about the role of the federal government and the project management uh, plan. Colleagues, this is an amendment to instruct the CAO as part of its process identifying funding for 130000 contribution to work with the County of Los Angeles, which has indicated that it may be able to provide the 130000 to the city for the study. This leverages a $7.3 million uh, study cost. And again, this is about understanding the hydrology, where the river could be changed, how we can stimulate natural habitats, uh, making sure that we do not lose integrity for the flood control channel to form as a flood control uh, uh, facility. So I ask for your vote. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. That matter is now before us. Open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Thirteen eyes. Very well, Mr. Reyes. You have that. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Perry, did you have a priority or we're going to go to public comment? I just do two. You want number two? All right. Uh, for Ms. Perry's... Request was, number two, then we'll go to public one comment. Card on that. We have one card on number two, and that is from Zuma Dog in the Valley on number two. Oh. Mr. Zuma Dog. Get it over with. Get the pain. Get it over with. Chris, I hear somebody saying get it over with. Hey, there's too much talking back there. It's going on over the mic. But anyway, I got to talk here because, you know, alcohol sales, Hotel Cecil. First of all, before we give Hotel Cecil the right to sell alcohol, they start to be, they need to be more compliant on following the housing policy with the affordable housing and affordable units and short term stay. Jam Perry, I hope you're listening. Hotel Cecil, they wouldn't give Zuma Dog the room like they're supposed to. Oh. I checked y'all. So anyway, you talk about alcohol. You know, nobody complains about too many alcohols in the city. But the medical marijuana dispensaries, everybody is, you know, saying that they can't be too close together. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't too many of them, but I just want to say, you never say that there's too many alcohol things, but you are too close together, and but you do complain about the marijuana dispensaries. We need to have a debate on this, and you need to start saying no on alcohol versus marijuana. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Perry. Thank you. This is um, an application with conditions imposed by Central LAPD. The license is for beer and wine only, no hard liquor, no off-site sales. This is a Type 41 on sale, on-site 
beer and wine for a bona fide public eating place, meaning they are required by the state to sell food and have a menu. It is not a license for a bar, and I ask for an I vote. Thank you. No other speakers on the queue. Open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Thirteen eyes. Thank you very much. That matter passes. Now we can go to public comment. Madam Clerk? No other priorities? Not right at the moment. You can do public okay. comment. So we'll do public comment. First speaker, Sky Anderson. No Sky Anderson. Uh, Clyde Williams. There are 17 public speakers, uh, colleagues. Long meeting. Uh, Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Barrett Road, El Sereno. DWP and your complicity in zero-sum budgeting or net revenue neutral? Revenue neutral means that every time an exemption or a variation is given for CD2, CD5, somebody in CD14, CD1 may have to pay. That is, for horses and livestock, if they get an exemption, somebody in El Sereno has to pay, or somebody in South LA has to pay. But Animal Services doesn't even know how many livestock and horses we have because they're not registered. High fire. Okay, CD5, CD2, and parts of CD14 have high fire zoning. We get free water, but the people that are living in the normal areas of LA, down on the flatlands, have to pay for our water. So there's no concept in most of the exemptions and variations that there's zero sum, revenue neutral, Budgeting. That is, if I get an exemption, somebody else has to pay. In the same way that the soil moisture indicators and controllers for irrigation, who benefits? The large commercial users. Who? Not us, not down in the flatlands. Thank you. Zuma Dog in the San Fernando Valley on public comment. Really? You sure? Nothing else to talk about? Got everything out of the way? Made the people wait long enough? I'm sure half the people left already? Perfectly fine. Paul Koretz, my man! Hootie hoo! Fantastic! Here is a man who stands up. I love Paul Koretz so far. Woo! And then also, Richard Alarcon loved it. He slammed down and beat down and said no to that laces pension commissioner, I believe it was. <laughs> laces pension commissioners. I can think of nobody that deserves more of a no vote. Greg Smith, thank you also for standing up. Now, is it true I heard that 15 LAX workers, the exempt type, are being fired by the mayor to strong arm the unions to take his concessions after he already screwed up the city? I heard 15 workers exempt to be fired. We'll see if my sources, by the way, federal sources, are correct because this is federal money. Um, ACLU, yes, city council will be getting a letter from the ACLU over their treatment of Zuma Dog. Failing to realize I'm a beloved icon that everybody's looking out for, and uh, Zuma Dog has had enough. And you will be served with the letter from ACLU and further legal action. Thank you very much, ACLU, for standing up for Zuma Dog. Um, the fake budget. Oh, billboard blight. Here's an issue. Zuma Dog exclusive. It's something that we're going to be talking about in chambers. Also, to Carmen Nooch, to Tonich, city attorney. Clear Channel billboards, not the digital ones, but if you notice the ones, the thin film kind, it's a new thin film type of billboard that they're putting up in this heat. They are all melting like the Wicked Witch of the West. So all through the city, you got billboard blight. Tijuana just called. They say, hey, LA, 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 fix your billboards. You're bringing down the property value. Put them on rent escrow. Demand fines. We cannot have 100% of Clear Channel billboards creating blight in the community. They've all faded and peeled. They have all peeled. Look around, council. Take it Control your district. Zuma dogs coming to town. CD2. Thank you, everybody. Maria Pena. Hello, my name is Helen Garrett. I work with Power 
Uh -huh. Ms. Garrett, the, you are not the speaker. Councilman, uh, Maria Pena had to leave. She was from uh, Okay, well, then, I'll, then I'll call the other speakers and as they come forward. We were all as a group. It was three. I understand that, but that's not the way we do it here. So you are who, ma'am? My name's Lisa Payne. I wasn't on the speaker card. Okay. I was just going to explain. Is anyone there on a speaker yes. card? Yes. Who? Helen, Helen Garrett right here and also Fina. And Jamie? Yes. Me. That's you, Jamie? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Because you have a speaker card together. Yes. Go ahead. I'm Helen Garrett, and I'm a proud member of Power and Power Works with um, Housing LA. We have here a stack of petitions. There's 2,461 of them in favor of a Los Angeles mixed income housing ordinance. We're here today because it's two months to the day that you're supposed to get busy working on this and, and start making this happen. We expect you, all of you, to do that in September. We don't want any more delays, and I'm sure you don't want any more delays. Mixed income housing is a vital thing. I live in a mixed income building under the Mellow Act. And I want to tell you that it has changed my life. That I have, for the first time in my life, I live in a place where there's a dishwasher. For the first time in my life, I live in a place where all the doors and drawers close. I live in a place where my door is secure and no one can come in and rob my house. This has made a vital difference to me and it will to thousands of people. We do not want any more delay on this issue. By September 15th, we expect to see this done. And we expect to see you all working hard. We also have some cards here that we'll be delivering later on. And these cards say, um, at the height of the building boom, nearly one, nine out of every 10 new apartments and condos were affordable to people making over $135,000 a year. That's out of reach for most Angelinos. It says, Dear Council Member, during the housing boom, developers built almost no new homes within reach of Angelinos. Now is the time to put new rules in place so that it doesn't happen again. Please make this Thank happen. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Michael Hunt. Mr. Hunt, you're going to have to remove your hood. Folks, you've had your comments. Thank you. Mr. Hunt is now up. Mr. Hunt, you're going to have to move your hood. We have to move. Are you refusing to move your hood? Are you refusing to move your hood? Mr. City Attorney. Do I have to? Mr. Hunt, we can't hear you. Remove your hood. No, no. I, I, this is part of my First Amendment privileges. Mr. City Attorney. He, his getup that he's wearing arguably has some First Amendment protection as symbolic speech, as distasteful and misguided as it is. However, however, it's, it's not an issue of anonymous speech because he's taken his but, hood off and on throughout the meeting. Uh, council members uh, it, it, are leaving the room. It, it, if, if his wearing that causes a disruption, then he could be told to remove it. Well, he's told to remove it. We are losing the quorum. But as of not, it's not a public... The quorum has been lost. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. The quorum has been broken. We are, uh, have lost the quorum. Not, this is not an official meeting anymore. I want to state for the record, you do have the right to keep that on. I want to say as a human being, I wish you wouldn't have it on, but that is your right to keep it on. We did lose quorum because council members left, so we do not have public comment. We do not have a meeting right now. Mr. State Attorney, we are adjourned. The, well, we're not adjourned because the loss of quorum. We can't adjourn. So, we could adjourn for la lack of a quorum. Well, we have lost the quorum. Yeah, we had council members leave. 
I believe they were disgusted by the appearances why they left. Zoom on Friday. Thank you. Good afternoon. Channel 35. Your city, your channel.